talked a lot about how health psychology is the science of how our stress can lead to real physiological issues and cardiovascular disease and diabetes in us. Now we're going to take a more positive spin on things and talk about positive psychology. So what is positive psychology? Well, as compared to clinical psychology, which is the science of how we predict who's at risk for clinical disorders, positive psychology is really the subfield of psychology that predicts who is more going to thrive or flourish or really benefit from life. So rather than be the science of predicting bad outcomes, it's really the science of predicting good outcomes and predicting thriving. And so positive psychology really came out of earlier humanist psychology, and but really grew on that. And so humanist psychology started as the science of describing how we're designed and driven towards love. We're designed for goodness. People are born good, innately good. However, positive psychology agreed with that and then built on it. And now in positive psychology, we have people who study the science of happiness and who is more likely to be happy. We have people who study things like humility and embarrassment and sharing and generosity and morality. And so the science of being good. And so there's lots of different areas we could go in positive psychology. I'm going to focus on two main ones. And the first one is how we are really driven towards love otherwise known more scientifically as positive regard. And so positive regard, according to the humanist psychologist, was the idea that someone treats you nicely. Someone is regarding you in a positive way. Now, this is really the work of Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers believed there was two main types of positive regard we can receive. There was conditional positive regard and unconditional positive regard. Conditional positive regard is very similar to what we might have learned about in behaviorism if you, psych if you took Psych 200 and Unit 6 last semester. And so conditional positive regard is the idea that if you do what other people want, they will reward you. If you please them and do everything they expect from you and change your behavior in the way that they desire, you will get a positive relationship with them. So that's the idea if parents are training a child to behave certain rules or to obey, the child will receive love in turn. And so conditional positive regard is the idea that if your parents want you to go to university and study and become a doctor, if you do those things, you'll make your parents proud. Or if your parents want you to go to business school and marry and have lots of children, if you do those things, you will make your parents proud. That is your conditional positive regard. In comparison, unconditional positive regard is the idea that someone will think highly of you and love you no matter what, that there's no rules, they will give you unwavering support, that you're free to express your true self and they will accept you as you are. This is the idea parents will love you whether you want to go to university or not, or you want to get married or not, or you're straight or gay, or you want to be politically active, or you want to be whatever. This is the idea that they will stand by you and let you become who you want to be. Now this can be a lot harder if your parents are thinking pragmatically and about the economy and about being able to financially support yourself, of course, but it's the idea that if you really have a dream, they'll let you follow it. Now what Rogers believed was that if somebody was only given conditional positive regard, they're learning to grow in some ways, but really stop their growth in other ways. We can think about this like the finely pruned bonsai tree. The bonsai tree is pruned to grow in some directions, but not others. And it becomes a very twisted tree that is very artificially grown. And it's the idea that if parents are constantly clipping your wings in some directions, they don't want you to be an artist, they don't want you to go into band, they don't want you to explore and take a gap year, then they're constantly trimming those bits of your trees. And if you're then they're constantly trimming those branches. They're not letting you branch out in those areas. And if you pursue that, if you only grow in the ways that make other people feel pleased with you, you're going to become a very twisted tree that's going to be growing in a very rigid fashion. And you're not allowing yourself to reach your full potential. Versus if parents offer unconditional positive regard, this allows you to become a full flourishing symmetrical tree who grows in all the ways you desire. It allows you to branch out in any direction you want to explore. It allows you to thrive and be your true self. Now, why does your true self matter? Well, Rogers believed it had to do with the notion of congruence and incongruence. And so the idea is if you are only doing things to please others, 
and you're not branching out in the ways you want to, there's going to be incongruence or discrepancy between your true self and your portrayed self. This is the idea, let's say your parents want you to get married and have kids and be a doctor and you do all those things, but on the inside, you really wanted to stay single and become a world explorer. Eventually, you have to reconcile that. Eventually, you will have to face yourself in the mirror and say, I didn't want this house in the suburbs. I wanted to go be climbing mountains and exploring the world. What am I doing tied down like this? And eventually, that's going to come to the surface. Whether you deal with it or not, maybe you'll repress it and suppress it for your whole life, but eventually it's going to cause a lot of psychological distress in you. And so the idea was, if there is discrepancy or incongruence between your true self and your portrayed self, you're going to experience immense maladjustment. There's going to be a conflict in your motivations, you're going to experience cognitive dissonance, and you're going to have a them versus you battle in your mind where you're only living for other people and you haven't started to live for yourself yet. In comparison, Rogers believed that if there was congruence, if you were able to be your true self and live as you want to, even if it meant taking the harder road, having congruence between your true self and your portrayed self meant there was no inner conflict. There could be conflicts getting enough food on the table, but you were true to yourself and you felt better about yourself. You felt more authentic. This allowed you to have more growth motivations, you could have more resilience, more care for yourself, and you could be more adaptable in the limelight. So Rogers believed we all can become aware of this at different points in our lives, and we can become aware of how we've twisted our branches and coiled ourselves around just to appease others, just to please society and to fit in, and not been true to ourselves. If you think about children's animation, there is a whole subgenre of princess tales. This is the metaphor, whether you're the princess who has the ice powers, who has to conceal and not reveal them and not be true to yourself, or if you're the princess who cuts her hair short and pretends she's a boy and goes off to battle because she wants her reflection to show who she is inside. And so it's about this congruence with your true self. Speaking of the princess genre, we could also talk about the boy who wished he was a prince by the genie uh, to try and not be true to himself. So being true to yourself is essential for your most psychological well-being. And what Rogers believed was if there was congruence, if your betrayed self and your true self matched up, you might experience self-actualization. We've heard self-actualization this semester already. We've heard it from Abraham Maslow who had his hierarchy of needs and self-actualization was at the top of the pyramid. This is the idea after your physiological and emotional needs were met, you might reach these peak or transcendent moments. Well, Carl Rogers, who was also a humanist psychology like Maslow, believed in self-actualization as well. And he believed self-actualization didn't come about from making sure your physical and, and emotional needs were met, but rather being true to yourself. So when we talked about Maslow, we talked about how you might get these peak transcendent moments at your wedding or at your graduation, Rogers believed that you would only get them at your wedding or graduation if your wedding and graduation reflected you actually want it for yourself. If you're graduating from law school or business school, but you didn't want to study law or business, your graduation probably would not result in a peak moment or a moment of transcendence or self-actualization. If at your wedding day you weren't super pumped about getting married, you're probably not going to experience self-actualization at that point in time. Rather, what Rogers believed was this moments of self-actualization is when you feel like you are on the right path for you. You've hit your targets and you're able to express your inner self and you feel like your life is a good fit for where you are now. So Rogers actually made a really long list of the personality traits that he believed self-actualizers would more likely have. And so people that were more likely to become self-actualizers and to reach these pivotal moments tended to have 14 different traits. And they were things like being able to have self-acceptance in themselves. They could accept their flaws and accept their strengths. They also had more honesty. If you think back to our unit of personality, this seems like someone who's probably high in humility and honesty. They were not controlling. They didn't have to be the control freaks. They were also not too dramatic. They didn't get wrapped up in the drama. They could let things go. There were also individuals that were comfortable with solitude. They weren't necessarily introverts, but when they were alone, they're comfortable being alone. But they also had a high intimacy motivation, not a power motivation, but really want to be authentic to others and really enhance and grow their social bonds. They also tend to be really helpful people. They tend to be more progressive and tolerant towards others. 
and very compassionate. Now they also tend to be very present in the moment. They didn't get caught up thinking about the past or thinking about the present. These individuals could also be creative and think of new ways of tackling different things. They could be very ethical, but at the same time, they're low in conformity. So if you think about our social psychology unit, they may be a person who doesn't give in to others. They do what they think is right in their own sense of ethics. And finally, they view life as miracles. And I love this one. Einstein has a quote that you can look at life as though nothing's a miracle, or you can look at life as though everything's a miracle. And these are the individuals who view every experience as a miracle. It's a miracle just to exist. So when I look at these 14 attributes, what I can see in here is perhaps high in humility, honesty, high in openness to experience, high in agreeableness, low in neuroticism, and it doesn't really say if they're lower high in conscientiousness or extroversion, I would say. But there's definitely some threads in there. So it overlaps with personality. We can see how this list also corresponds to what we're talking about in social psych, also corresponds to what we're talking about in motivation. So I like talking with self-actualizers at this point in the semester to kind of let you see what Rogers believed the point of our existence was. He believed the point was to get to this area where you could become a self-actualizer. And this reflects a lot of what Buddhist psychology suggests as well. It's the idea of getting to this point where you can reflect and embrace everything that we have in this existence, but not get caught up in the minutiae of it.